Okay, we're on page 150. We're by the, um, we're in the middle of what's called Chinuch Katan, which is the introduction to the second part of Tanya, which is called Shar HaYichud Vemunah. So last week, we started off by quoting the Pasuk, Chanech L'Nar Al Pidarke, Gam Ki Askim L'Yosr Mimena. And the Alter Rebbe asks, Chanech L'Nar Al Pidarke, the implication is, that uh, the chinuch is according to the level of the child. Not giving over the concept, the idea, in its uh, most mature or ultimate or ideal or truest form, but you're, it's, there's something, uh, it's like a, a chinuch. It's a chinuch. And therefore, the question becomes, what is, why is it something so special that we say that Gamki Yaskin Lo Mimena that also when the child becomes older. becomes older, the child is not going to move away from that chinuch. To the contrary, don't you hope that when the child grows older, they will move away, they will graduate to why, a higher level? Why doesn't say when you yikdal Why ki yaskin? Okay, that's another question. I don't know the answer to that question, but we might. Much old, much. Person is much older than Kiyidan. Right, he's trying to bring out that even when his mom is an old uh, person, uh, still. Uh, with a right. white beard, let's Yeah. So the Alter Rebbe then moves on to say that there are two different levels of Ava Sashem. And ultimately, that's where we're heading to that there's a, you might want to say, what there's a Chinuch level of Ava Sashem, which is a lower level, a less mature level of Ava Sashem, and there's a higher level of Ava Sashem. And last week we spoke about the first level, the first level being the higher level. The higher level of Avas Hashem is the Ava which is experienced by Tzaddikim. And this is an Ava which is not created by the person. It's the revelation of the Neshama. The, every single one of us has a Neshama and at the very core of the, our Neshama, at the very essence of our Neshama, every single one of us has an incredible love for Hashem, the deepest love imaginable, so much so that uh, Yidin are ready to go on Mesir Asnafesh, not only Tzadikim, but uh, all Yidin are ready to go Mesir Asnafesh, Al Kiddush Hashem, out of our desire to connect to Hashem, to be one with Hashem, and not Chas Shalom to, uh, to be separated from Hashem. But for most of us, this tremendous Avon is not uh, something that we experience. And in our everyday in our everyday lives, but great tzaddikim actually live with this ecstatic love for Hashem, which produces an incredible amount of joy, um, and it's partially the gili of the neshama, the revelation of the deepest parts of the neshama. However, in order to arrive at this love, in order to arrive at the revelation of this love, once again, it's not um, not we don't create this love, but in order to arrive at the revelation of this love requires. Tremendous amount of avoida. It takes a tremendous amount of birur vezichoch, a refinement of the body. We need to uh, get rid of the the coarseness and the, the, all the gashmias that we're that we're in in order to be able to allow the neshama to shine. It also requires a lot of Torah and mitzvahs. This is the higher level of avas Hashem, which again is experienced by tzaddikim. And now we're going to talk about the second level of love. We're going to start inside. We're starting from where it says Vihashenis. If you look over here, it's on, it's on the second column, the first word on the line. If you look over here, you'll see where I'm pointing. Vihashenis, right over here. First word on the line. Vihashenis. The second level of Avas Hashem. This is an Ava which is accessible for every single Yid, not only for Tzadikim. And how is that? This is an Ava which is created When a person thinks, thinks well and deeply and contemplates those matters that awaken the Ava for Hashem and the heart of every single Yid. What, what, what do we contemplate? What is this Isbainanus that brings to Ava? So he says, first of all, first of all, there's the most general idea, which is that Hashem is our life. He is the life of our life. Yes, our life is we have a neshama, but who gives life to our neshama? Is Hashem. 
And just like a person loves his own life, and that's um, the deepest love that we have is for ourselves. King Yahweh Hashem, the same thing is, we will love Hashem. Kasher Yisboinen, when a person contemplates V'yasun Malibay and takes to heart, Ki Hashem hu nafshei ha'amitis v'chai of mamish, that Hashem is mamish, his emesa, neshama, his emesa life, and his, and literally his life force. Kamesh Yekasev B'zayar al-Pasek nafshi i'v'yisicha v'gaymer. It says in the Zayar, in the Pasek nafshi i'v'yisicha, we encountered this earlier on in Tanya, in Perik Memdalda Tanya, the Zayar comments on the Pasek. The Pasek says, Nafshi Ivisicha Balayla. And as we, we said, the Zayar asks on this that Luchayra, the diktuk, the grammar is a little wrong over here. What does it mean, Nafshi Ivisicha? Nafshi Ivisicha literally means, My soul, I long for you. It should say, Nafshi Ivisach, my soul longs for you. Nafshi Ivisicha means, My soul, I long for you. What does that mean? And the Zayar explains that in this Pasuk we are referring to Hashem as Nafshi. We're turning to Hashem and saying, Hashem, Nafshi, you are my soul, you are my source of life, and therefore, Ivisicha, I desire you and I long for you. And this is, uh, you might want to say, the simplest and easiest way to arrive at Avas Hashem. Because it doesn't require of one to suppress or abnegate their ego. Sometimes you say, you know, okay, I love myself too much, I'm going to stop loving myself, I'm going to start loving Hashem. But that's difficult, because stopping to love oneself is not an easy task. And even uh, suppressing that love, and even saying, okay, I'm not going to focus on that, is very difficult. But over here we're saying something very different, don't stop loving yourself. To the contrary, love yourself very much. At the same time, contemplate and recognize who's your life. You love your life, then you, then automatically, by extension, you love, Hashem. you love Hashem. For example, this is an example that we gave in the past. Imagine a person, um, Rahman al-Aslan, was in a very precarious medical situation and his life was in danger and came along some sort of doctor and healed him. Especially imagine if the doctor wasn't paid for it. There was a favor, the doctor did a favor and healed him. Can imagine the ava that that person will have to the doctor for saving his life. Does this person have to suppress his love for himself in order to be able to love the doctor? No, to the contrary. The more the person loves themselves, the more they're going to love the doctor actually. So this is on a very basic, on a very basic level. Ava number one, Dr. Rebbe discusses over here, contemplating the idea that Hashem is Chai of Mamish, is our life, and therefore, if we love ourselves, then automatically we love Hashem, who gives us our life. And by the way, we can add to that perhaps, not only does Hashem give us our life, what else does He give us? Not only our life itself, but everything that's in our life. Our houses, our mishpacha, our health, uh, everything, parnasa, everything we have is all from Hashem. It's taking some time to think about that leads one to an incredible Avas Hashem. Yes? We said... Uh, you have to love Hashem like you love yourself. So why we said Vayahavta l'arecha kamocha and not Vayahavta l'Hashem kamocha? If I love myself, and according to the Balatanya, you have to love Hashem like you love yourself. So why the sentence said Vayahavta l'arecha kamocha, not Vayahavta l'Hashem kamocha? According to this... I didn't say that you have to love Hashem like you love yourself. I didn't, uh, we're not limiting the love to Hashem to that. All we're saying is, is that a person can leverage their love for themselves in order to arrive at a love for Hashem. We should love Hashem more than we love ourselves. But at the end of the day, your, your self-love can also be leveraged towards arriving at an Ava Hashem. That's in general. And in order to arrive at this Ava, you don't even have to know too much about Hashem. You don't have to know too much about Hashem's greatness. Because all you have to know is that Hashem is the one who gives you your life and automatically you love Hashem. And if Hashem isn't so great, I'm saying is whether Hashem created um, two worlds or four worlds or a hundred worlds or how many malachim serve Hashem and you know the different types of energies that come from Hashem and whether how, how exactly how bleak will Hashem is all of this for this very basic a level of love all of that is irrelevant all you need to know is Hashem is the one who gives me life and therefore I love him that's why the Alter Rebbe he perceives this by saying this is derech klal this is just a general 
a general thought that you have um, about Hashem. And for this, to arrive at this love, there's no need to enter any particulars about Hashem. It's a very general idea. But let's take it further. Let's think also to further, to, uh, to strengthen the love and to augment the love. Let's go into detail. Now, think not only about the fact that Hashem gives you life. Take time to think about the greatness of... You missed some words. Shal? Malach, you said HaKadosh Baruch, you skipped. Yeah, yeah, then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's Rashi Tevis. What does Malach Malachi mean? The king of, <coughs> of all angels. Malach Malachi. Yeah. What's the, the literal translation? The king of the kings. That's Malach Amlachim. What's Malach Malachi Amlachim? Malach Amlachim. Amen. Malach Amlachim means king of kings, right? What does Malach Malachi Amlachim mean? It's not so complicated. King of the king of the kings, right? It's not another. Who's well, the other king, though? When you're thinking, maybe it's the angels, maybe it's the higher kings, maybe. In the, but the point being is that when you're, to, this is the whole point. When you're going derech prat, so this is you focus on the details. Hashem isn't only the king; he's the king of kings. He's not only the king of kings; he's the king of king of kings. Okay, now we talk, have to open up the svarim and figure out who are the kings, who are the kings of the kings that Hashem is. But all of these all contribute to having a greater love. Because when you're going in details, the details matter. The more you understand in detail Hashem's greatness, the more you'll get to Ava. Derech Pratis, you think about an HaKadosh Baruch Hu, right? What does HaKadosh mean? What does Baruch mean? All these things, think in detail. Derech Pratis, in a very detailed way. Kasher yuchal se'es b'sichle, as much as your mind can understand. can process, right? And, right? Limited though. And every single person obviously is different. Some people can, their, their mind can, can grasp more, some people less. And then, then you contemplate that which is above, which, is above which you can understand. How, do you, how can you understand that which is above what you can understand? <laughs> but as explained in Siddhas in different places, there is what we can understand and there's what we can't understand. But sometimes we have an understanding that there's what we don't understand. That's and you could think about that also. Think about how much there is that you don't understand. Wouldn't that be Ruch HaKadosh? No, no. There's simple. So how um, can you understand something that you can't understand? Unless it's like you understand it. It's normally you can't understand, understand it. By, un, by, by understanding that there <coughs> is something that you don't understand, but you know that it's greater. No, it's but you recognize that. that that thing's not on. There is sometimes a greatness that you can appreciate. It's greater than you, but you can appreciate it. And sometimes there's a greatness that you look at it, and you recognize it as greatness, and you realize that it's so great. But you don't understand it. That's that true. that it, that it's totally beyond you. But you, yeah, it's but, you uh, but you understand that it is greater than you. That's the point. If you ever open up a Maimer Chassidus, you know there. Sometimes you look at a Maimer and you appreciate yeah. its greatness, the depth. And yeah. sometimes you look at it and you don't understand the word what it's saying. <laughs> and but you you know that there is depth there. Right. You're appreciating that there is there's a lot that that's beyond you, a lot that you can't understand. And the same thing is with Hashem. Your mind reaches a certain limit, and then you realize there's that the, that there's so much more that uh, that you can understand. You know, people would come to the Rebbe, write to the Rebbe all the time. This is something if you look in the Rebbe's letters, it's almost a common theme. And people would write. Uh, you know, the Rebbe became the Rebbe also in 1950, which was shortly after the Holocaust. And we've we've talked about this in the past. I think uh, it was a traumatized nation. We can only can't even begin to imagine what it's like. Rebbe became Rebbe in 1950. Six years after six million of us were killed. And people write, where was Hashem? It can't be that there's Hashem. It can't be that there's Hashem if the Holocaust happened. It can't be. Hashem could never, would never have allowed the Holocaust to happen. I don't believe in Hashem anymore. And the Rebbe had a fairly consistent answer to this. And the Rebbe says, you know, actually your question tells me that you believe very, very strongly in Hashem. Because if there is no Hashem, then there is no complaint. There is a Holocaust, yeah. And obviously, if there is no, there is no rule of the world, then uh, everything happens. Now, you're saying that you were expecting that Hashem should make sure that everything in this world, that all seven billion people, okay, then there weren't seven, whatever, that, that, and everything that happens in the world should transpire and everything should be exactly according to plan and good and everything. 
And I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. What the Rebbe was saying over here is, can you do that, by the way? Can you do that? In other words, if I give you a world with 7 billion people, and not only 7 billion people, 7 billion beetles running around the Amazonian rainforest, that also, the whole world has to be run. And everything has to be according to plan, and everyone has to come out on top. In other words, I can't say 6.9 6 billion people, it'll be good for them. And for that, uh, the other 0.1 billion, they're... Uh, they're, they're going to have to be set. No, everyone, f f uh, fairness and justness and goodness for everyone. Can you do that? Can you even invent a computer that can do it? You can't, yeah. right? But you're expecting that of Hashem. Now, if you're expecting that of Hashem, what you're automatically saying is that you understand that Hashem has superior intelligence completely beyond yours because you can't do that. So you're expecting that this Hashem of yours should have intelligence which is completely... Um, what was the word you told me last week in the car? What? Not exponentially. There was a, um, there was a word. A, a quantum leap. Quantum leap. Right. A qu you're expecting that Hashem's intelligence should be quantumly greater than yours. Did I use the word properly? Yeah, I think so. Quantumly greater than yours. Now, let me ask you. If Hashem's uh, intelligence is quantumly greater than yours, do you think he'll be able to understand everything that he's doing? No. In other words, follow, uh, follow it. What you're expecting of Hashem requires Him to have intelligence, not only which is greater than yours, but which is so much greater that it's completely beyond you. And if that's the case, and Itakia is the case, then sometimes we're going to have to lift up our hands and say, I don't understand. But I trust that Hashem is the one who's running Itakia and He knows what's going on. And this is an, just an instance of an example. Sometimes we look at Hashem and we say, wow, that's amazing what He's doing. Sometimes we look at Hashem and say, it's so, it's so great, I have no, it's totally beyond. But I read my mind, my mind is machriach. My mind compels me to say that there's so much that I don't understand also. In fact, there's a very famous uh, um, um, phrase. I forget who, it was one of the, one of the poets in the, in the Middle Ages. I forget the name at the moment. Who he wrote that Tachlis Hayidia Shalei Neda'acha that the whole purpose of our study of Hashem, the whole purpose of our trying to understand Hashem, is that ultimately we should come to the recognition, that we don't understand you at all. But think for a moment. It's very easy to say, I don't understand Hashem. A one-year-old, a three-year-old can also say that. No. There's a whole journey of understanding, a whole journey of idea, And then when you reach that limit, you realize there's so much more that I don't understand. That's such a, a, a richer and greater appreciation of what you can understand when you reach your limit as opposed to when you never started the journey in the first place. That's what he's saying. Think into the greatness of Hashem. Appreciate that which you can appreciate. And then you reach a point where you realize, where you realize, not that you believe, you realize that based on everything I understand, I also realize that there is so much more that I don't understand. So this is step one of this contemplation. Step one of this is boininus, this protestic is boininus, this detailed is boininus, is thinking about the greatness of Hashem in a very detailed way and are figuring out as much as you can, as much as you can understand, and then taking it even beyond that, even, even journeying somewhat into the realm of the area which you cannot understand. How does that lead you to love Hashem? So how does this, how does that is us lead you to loving Hashem? How does understanding Hashem's greatness lead you to love Him? Let's continue. The six, six lines reference. from the bottom, right? <coughs> right, Yira, I could understand how it leads yeah, to, but how does yeah, it lead right, to So the Achakach and afterwards he's bringing the step number two. Then contemplate by Avas Hashem. Then you think into the great and wondrous love that Hashem has for us. How Hashem came down to Mitzrayim. The most depraved, the most uh, impure of lands. In order to take out our Neshamas, the Neshamas of Kuala Yisrael, from this, uh, the, we got to say in English, the smelting pot. The, the, the smelting, you, you smelt the uh, gold. Or right, kura, kura barzel, it's made out of barzel, but that's where you create where you, the... Where you melt the gold. That's where you, where you the gold, the refinery, the gold refinery. Shehu oh. HaSitra Akhra, Rahman Oslan, that's Mitzrayim, that, that, that refinery was the Sitra Akhra. And Hashem descended there, the Karvenu Elav, to bring us close to Him. Ule Dabkenu Bishmoi Mamesh, 
and to cause us to cleave to his name, literally, Vuhu Ushmoi Echad, his name, which he is one with his name. Dehainu, meaning, Shere Mimanu Metachlis Hashiflus Vahatuma Hashem lifted us from the ultimate lowliness and unholiness, Letachlis Hakadusha Vidulasa Yizbarach, and he lifted us up to the ultimate in holiness and greatness, the greatness of Hashem, She'ein la'kates v'tachlis. Infinite. Which is infinite. Azai then, k'mayim apam l'apanim, like water mirrors a face, t'sayrin ha'avah b'lev kal maskil, u'mazbainin b'inyan zeh, the heart of every single person who contemplates this idea will be awakened with love, b'umka d'liba, from the depths of the heart, live as Hashem, to love Hashem, ava aza, a powerful love, will adafka by him to connect to him, believe in nefesh, with heart and soul, as will be explained at length. And where is that? We already learned this in Perik Mem Hay through Mem Tes, uh, Mem Vav through Mem Tes of time. But as mentioned last week, the Altarebbe says, as will be explained for reasons we spoke about in last week's lesson. So you can think about Hashem's greatness, that's not necessarily going to bring to a love. Because Hashem is great, therefore I love Him. If I think about how much, Bill, how much money Bill Gates has, am I going to love Him? <laughs> not necessarily, right? Love Dafka, what's especially, the correlation? Especially if you have a hard life, and a person has a lot of sickness, yeah. he, doesn't, he can't, he can't uh, have the hergish to love, to, you know... And also, thinking about Hashem's love for us, that will create a love for Him. If I think about how much Hashem loves us and how much He has done for us, that will bring to a love. But not the most incredible love. But when you combine the two, number one, thinking about how great Hashem is. And once you understand and have some sort of idea in the Rebbe Musakel and just how great Hashem is, and then you transition to thinking about how much He loves us, the greater He is, the more his love for us is going to evoke within us a reciprocal love for him. The greater he is, this we spoke about in Tanya, yeah, we learned it. Yeah. This is, uh, th- th- there's, you can't compare, if a simple person comes and loves me, I love him back. If a king comes and loves me and is mekar of me, it's so much more. And the greater the king, the more the, more the love is going to be. So, um, Knowledge is so important. The knowledge of the greatness of Hashem leads directly to Abbas Hashem. Again, when you add in that extra part about how, how much Hashem loves us. You know, the story you said about a, a tzaddik, someone once came to him and told him about some bad avarice that he had done. And he asked the tzaddik, I want to do, uh, want to do tshuva. And he figured the tzaddik would tell him, you know, fast this amount of days and give this much to tzedakah. The tzaddik says, I don't want you to do anything. All I want to do is, I want to learn with you. I want to learn with you, Torah. Okay, I want to make a chavrusa with you. I don't know, once a day, once a week. They say that. They make a, a shir together. And what does the tzaddik learn with him? He starts learning with him all about the greatness of Hashem. And then he starts learning with him about uh, Averis and what uh, the impact that Avera has. And after a little while, the person, he was so broken hearted. And that's truva. And the fact, the way the story is said is that the, the, the tzaddik said, after a while, the tzaddik says, you know what, this is, this is becoming too hard on you. Go, go do some fasting. That's easier. <laughs> Can you do truva without recognizing what, what it's another? It's, yeah, fasting is easy. It's not, of course, fasting is not easy. It's not comfortable. It's not, it's not easy. But the ultimate is come to recognition, come to understanding of who Hashem is. You want to understand Hashem's love for us? You want to feel love for Hashem? You have to understand a little about who this Hashem is. You can say, That's true. That's it. Now, this is the second level of love. The first level of love we spoke about last week, and that level of love is a love which is a revelation of the deepest love of the Neshama. The, lo- the Ava that we're talking about this week is different. The Ava we're talking about this week is an Ava which is created through a person's husbandiness, through a person's contemplation. This Ava, this second level of Ava, the Ava which is created through our husbandiness, through our meditation, 
Ratsa Moshe Rabbeinu Alaf Ashalem Lita Belev Kol Yisrael. This is what Moshe wanted to plant in the hearts of all of all Yidin. The Parsha Vaata Yisrael. In Parshas, I believe it's Parshas Ekev, where Moshe says Vaata Yisrael Vegoimer. Where he says, Now Yidin, what does Hashem want? He wants you to love him and to fear him. And it continues. The Pasuk Hey, he tell, Moshe tells the Yidin, Hey, Lashem Elikach Hashemayim Vegoimer. I want you to understand. That Hashem is the one, He owns the heavens, and Shmei HaShemayim, the heavens of the heavens. And nevertheless, despite His greatness, this Pasuk is talking about the greatness of Hashem. Moshe says, contemplate how great Hashem is. Hein l'Hashem alekecha HaShemayim u'Shmei HaShemayim, right? Hashem is the one in control of the heavens, the earth, everything. However, rak ba'avi secha chashak v'goymer. Who does Hashem desire? Not the angels, not the heavens. He wants... Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and then Vayivchar, and he chose their children after him. And therefore, Umaltam Vagoymer, therefore he says, take off the covering on your heart, start having Avos Hashem. Beshivim Nefesh Vagoymer, and then Moshe tells him how the Eden went down to Mitzrayim with 70 people on Avashem, they, they, then they grew, Hashem took them out. So Moshe is talking about the greatness of Hashem, and Hashem's Ava and kindness towards Kalal Yisrael, therefore Vahapta Vagoymer, therefore you shall love Hashem. So Moshe was trying to tell the Eden, this kind of Ava, he's trying to tell him, contemplate Hashem's greatness, contemplate how much Hashem loves you, and thereby arrive at a reciprocal love for Hashem. V'lachain siyem devarav, and that's why Moshe concludes his words, al avazu, when he's talking about this Ava, he says, asher anoichi metzave eschem la'asoyisa. I'm commanding you this love, la'asoyisa, to do it. Now you remember last week we asked, what does it mean, how do you say la'asoyisa about an Ava? It's an emotional It's an emotion. How do you say La Soisa to do it? But the answer is she Ava Asuya believe. This is an Ava which we make in the heart. Through the understanding and the and the mental connection. And contemplating those things which awaken the Ava, as I mentioned earlier. And this actually is what Moshe commanded the Yidma earlier. When he said in the Shema, "Vahoyu imparshes vayischanan, vahoyu advaram eila, asher neichi metzavchei imalu vavecha," Moshe tells the Yidden, "Shema Yisrael, Hashem elokeinu, Hashem echad." And then he says these words about Hashem echad. I want them to be on your heart. Contemplate these ideas. Kedei shaydei zatavi laavas Hashem, and this way you'll come to love Hashem. Kedei isa b'sifri. Al pasuk says the sifri says on this pasuk that how do you arrive uh, by uh, to avas Hashem is by contemplating the greatness of Hashem. Regarding this second type of love, shayich lashon mitzvah v'tzivui. We can say the, that you can, you can say a command. If you notice earlier, it says, "Asher noichi mitzave eschem la asoisat." Moshe is commanding the Eden to love Hashem. And the obvious question becomes, how do you command someone to love something? Either can you command the feeling? Either you love or you don't love. This is a question that the the Mezitzia Magid asked. Um, we have to Hashem Elikecha, the same question we can have on Avos Yisrael. How is it possible to command someone to love? But what's the answer? The Hainu, the command is not to love. You can't command the person to love. Well, right? If you like chocolate ice cream, I can't command you to, uh, to, to suddenly start liking vanilla ice cream. It doesn't work that way. But what we could command, the Hainu, Lassim Libei Vidaite, that a person should um, take to heart and to mind, to contemplate things that awaken the heart. But the first level of love that we discussed, that's not something we create, it's like a fire, it's like a flame that goes up on its own. You can't command it. So we have here two levels of love, one which we can have a mitzvah for, one which we create, and therefore Hashem can command us to create it, and one which is a higher level of love. I just do also want to point out, regarding the higher level of love, it's not only that the higher level of love is it's qualitatively, uh, it's quantitatively greater. It's also qualitatively greater. When you create a love, automatically that love is not an expression of your essence. If I think about something until I arrive at a love for it, that means that it's somewhat of an external love to me. It's imposed on me. I imposed it on myself, yes. It's not my natural state. 
it requires thought. And the love is also commensurate to my understanding. As much as I understand, that's how much I love. As opposed to something which is just me, that is so much more powerful because it's me. It's not something which is, forget about the fact that it can't be taken away. It's also, it's, there's nothing more powerful than the expression of, of oneself. See it by a child. Sorry? You see it by a child versus a spouse. Okay, go ahead. The what? By a child. The love for a child. It's much deeper, no matter what. The person always loves the child. Okay, the always loving is a different point. We're talking about the depth of uh, a depth of the ava. Okay, I, I, I'd stay away from that muscle for, for a different reason. Not because I can argue for different for different reasons, although I understand what you're saying. I'm just thinking. Uh, you know, we, we get we get invitations for simchas. And now, how often, how many times did you get an invitation? You look at it. Should I go? Should I not go? Are they going to care if I come? Are they not going? Are they going to be hurt? Do I want to go? Am I interested in going? Maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. Okay. And then either we end up going or we don't end up going. And sometimes you get an invitation to a simcha. Let's say it's uh, your closest friend. Or your, your brother is making a hasana. And there's nothing going on in your head. There's a force I'm going. Why am I going? That's a silly question. Why am I going? What do you mean, why am I going? Because that's where I want to be. Now, there, you, you'll never compare the simcha that you experience at the type 2 of simcha than to the first type, type 1. Even if you decide you should go and your mind, then the day you're there because your mind told you you have to be there. Even if you create excitement in yourself and you're happy, and then there's sometimes something which is the, the, from the deepest part of you. It's not because your mind told you. There's no mind over here. It's you, of course. That's, that's, that's exactly what I want. That's the difference also between these two levels of Ava. The level of Ava of Tzadik Tashem. It's not just that the tzaddik has some more love, or that the tzaddik, or that the tzaddik's love never goes away. It, it, it's a qualitatively different love. It's a love which is an expression of the deepest part of self. It's not a love that's imposed by some sort of sort of cheshbon or some sort of thought or calculation. It's just an expression of self, and that's why the second type of love is like chinuch to the first love. Remember, we talk chinuch lenar al pidarke. The first type of love is important, Taka, but ultimately we're looking to graduate, we're looking to, to, to be able to tap into this Ava, which Taka Tzadikim only experience it in its fullest degree, but we're looking to somehow tap into this greater level of Ava, an Ava which is a real expression of the deepest part of who we are. But this Ava, we, we can't have a command for it. It's, it's, it is or it isn't. It's there. Right? Can I command you to love someone like you love your brother? There's no such thing. It's not shaykh. It's either there or it's not. I can command you to love someone. I can command you to think about how great someone is. Bill Gates, I think he gave, is giving a billion dollars to stuck or something. I don't know. So if you think about it long enough, you'll, you'll admire him. You might even love him. But that's all ava suya. That's a created love. The love for... Yeah. The, the, the love of the tzaddik. We all have it. It's just the tzaddik experience. Correct. On an everyday basis. Whereas by us, when it comes in the Soyin, the Kiddush Hashem, maybe Yom Kippur, when we're saying Shema Yisrael, but that's something which is a... Uh, whatever. In other places in Chassidus, it talks about that uh, perhaps during davening we can try to tap into it. We need a lot of help for that. We need to give tzedakah for that. But um, it's not, it's definitely not the everyday... So they can walk around and that's their uh, regular existence. Not only is it impossible to say that there's a mitzvah to have this higher level of love, second line from the top of the second column on page Ayin Vav, yeah. This is the reward of tzaddikim, that they're getting a taste of Elam Haza while they're in Elam Haza, of Elam Haza while they're in Elam Haza. The Gemara says, I think it's Baba Basra, that the Avis Hitiman Akadish Baruchu, that in the Avis, while they were in this world, they had Me'en Elam Abba. That's why we Bakel Mikel Koil. That they had uh, the Koil, they had Elam Abba. In this world, they, what is Elam Abba? What is Elam Abba? What is the pleasure of Elam Abba? The pleasure of Elam Abba. It's a good Zach. Sorry, what? It's a good Zach. It's a good Well, what kind of good Zach? <laughs> <laughs> right? Good. Yeah. It's not, it's, it's not a surplus of ice cream over there. What is Elam Abba? <laughs> 
to be litzvech to Hashem, to be be close to Kaddish Baruch Hu. The deepest, the deep, whatever that's supposed to mean. The deepest and most incredible emotion, feeling that a person can have in this world is a feeling of love, a feeling of attachment to another. Whether it's within a marriage, whether it's parents to children, whether it's in friendship, to experience that love. I don't, I don't mean just uh, when the when the relationship is in cruise control and feeling, uh, you know, and it's and the, and the emotions are, are 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 bubbling beneath the surface. Everyone and everyone here in this room, everyone in the world, there are times when you just experienced, and the, the heart is just bursting. It's such an intense, incredible feeling, um, and. Olam Haba is having that feeling for Hashem, experiencing that Avas Hashem. It's the most incredible feeling that there is. And Sadiqim have that feeling over here in Olam Haza, they are able to experience that. Shaleh HaNema, regarding this Avoida, it says, Avoidas Matana Etinus Kunaschem. It's a gift. It's not part of our Avoida Bechal. It's a gift given. It's Haldarech, the idea of Kahuna. Kemeshi is Barbara Mekoyma, as will be explained in its place. So Adkan. Up until here, we've explained the two different levels of of Ava Sashem. Ah, however, it is known to those who know. Time of the Kra, the meaning of the Pasuk, might exceed when it says, Kisheva Yipel Sadik Vikam. The Pasuk says that Sadik falls seven times and each time he arises. Do you understand this Pasuk, Ruven? So why is he at Tzadik? He falls seven times. Okay, so... Or maybe he's able to, be apparently, recover, to recover. Apparently, you're not from the Yoidim. <laughs> no, because he says over here, <laughs> It is known to... Because there are a lot of people who aren't Yoidim, and they look at the Pasuk and they're like, Oh, so Tzadik can also do Averis, right? Sheva Tzadik yipot Tzadik v'kam. Says Alter Rebbe, no, no, no. The time of the Kra, the meaning of this Pasuk is only Yadu Ali Yoidim. It's only the people who understand, understand what this Pasuk means. Because it doesn't mean what it means on a simple level. Mm-hmm. You know, we look at it, we say, ah, so I make mistakes, I do have a The tzaddik also does. The Pasuk says, Sheva yipel tzaddik vikam. So therefore, the Rebbe, the Rebbe also probably does have a Just a vikam. No, no, no. You do all the yedim. What does it mean? It's something else entirely. Simple question would be that you'd be a bain. Sorry? Pasuk, then why is he not a bain? Cool. What, what does the word yipil mean? Let's find out. He says, "Will be frat, and not only that. Shevah yipil tzaddik become the way the Alter Rebbe is going to explain, explain it. It's not a mistake. It's not that the tzaddik is going and suddenly boom, he falls. He's in the field. No, no. It's actually part of being a tzaddik. It's part of the process of being a tzaddik. And as we'll see, because sha'adam nikra mahalach v'lo yoimid. We know the pasuk says." The difference that when he quantifies, the, when the pastor wants to uh, define the difference between Bnei Yisrael, people, and Malachim, so the pastor says, Venasati lacha mahalchim bein ha'im de me'ela. Malachim are called oim dem. Malachim are called. They're static. They're, they're static, they stand. And we are called mahalchim. We, uh, we are movers, we're constantly progressing. And this is true not only of regular people, but this is also true of tzaddikim. Tzaddikim are constantly moving from one level to another. The Gemara says, Tzaddikim, that tzaddikim are constantly ascending. So why and as we shall see, part of the and as we shall see, part of the process of moving up is yipul. We'll find out why. Take one step back. You, you always need to take one step back before moving up, and we'll find out why. So, Chas we're not talking about Avedas. We're talking about part of the process of being a tzaddik is you're constantly moving up, and as a rule in life, whenever you're moving up, you have to take a step back down. Why is that necessary? And why is that? So, the Rebbe brings on this uh, a marshal that says that Reb Zera when he went to Eretz Yisrael and he wanted to learn Talmud Yerushalmi so it says he fasted depending on which gears in the Gemara either 40 fasts or 100 fasts in order to forget Talmud Bavli in order to be able to properly learn Talmud Yerushalmi think about that for a second because Talmud Yerushalmi is on a much higher level than Talmud Bavli the Gemara says Talmud Bavli 
that uh, the Pasuk says that you put me into a dark place, that's Tama Babli. Compared to Eretz Yisrael, Eretz Yisrael is dacha, much holier, obviously, than Babel. So the Limud HaToyra in Eretz Yisrael is much higher than the Limud HaToyra, which is in Babel. <laughs> Sorry? But the Chachamim were in Babel. They were Chachamim in Eretz Yisrael also. Right, but the, uh, the, the, the Chachamim in Babel were, were on a higher level, weren't they? No, they weren't. Obviously, so they were not. Well, they were not. Now, at a certain point in time, they stopped being Chachamim in Eretz Yisrael. The whole, everything moved to Babel. And uh, the Talmud, ba- Talmud Bavli, Talmud Yerushalmi was completed a hundred years before Talmud Bavli. But at the time when there was Amiram and Eretz Yisrael and Amiram and Bavli, the Limud HaToyra and Eretz Yisrael was on a much higher level. The Pasuk says, it was Ahav HaOretz Ahi Toivahi, Pasuk in Bereshis, and this Chazal tell us, Ahav Ein Toyra Ketoyra Eretz Yisrael. Ki Metzi and Teitzit Toyra. There's no question, there's nothing, the Toyra and Eretz Yisrael is on a higher level. Avira Di Yisrael Machkima. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is that the halach is like when there's machlekes between, between Tama Bavli and Tama Yerushalmi. The halach is like Tama Bavli. That's interesting. Why? So this explains that because the limud and Tama Bavli is on a lower level, so therefore it requires so much more work, and, so, and because of the darkness, that ultimately through the tremendous avoid they're required for Tama Bavli, you reach an even higher level of MS. But that's a topic for a different day. That's a real uh, yeah. <laughs> but the point is, ultimately, Reb Zera wanted to go and he wanted to learn this new, and he knew. That if he wanted to be able to learn Talmud Yerushalmi, the Talmud Bavli that he has is going to hinder him. It's going to block him. He had to forget it. If you want to move to someplace entirely higher, you need to forget beforehand. You need to move away from the place you were beforehand to reach the higher place. In Chassidus, the words are between one yesh and another yesh, there has to be ayin in the middle. Between one something and another greater something, there has to be nothingness. You have to move away first. You can't... It's like uh, from a, for, for a seed to become a tree, first the seed has to rot. Because the tree is so much greater than the seed, the seed first has to rot, and then the tree can emerge. It's also brought down that when the to going to Gan Eden, that before Neshama goes to Gan Eden, it has to... it has to... Um, toivel. And on the hard denur, it has to toivel in a river of fire. In order to forget Chezu Dahai Alma, it has to forget what this world looks like. As long as the Neshama remembers what this world looks like, it can't truly appreciate the next world. Now, we have to be very clear over here. You can compare, though. Sorry? If you can't compare, you won't appreciate. You know the difference between the two, then you can appreciate it. To learn something completely higher and greater, everything you have beforehand is going to handicap you, it's going to hinder you. You're still using the tools from beforehand. Before and you have to move away from it. And uh, to be clear over here, it's brought down many places in Chassidus. When we talk about the idea of Mahalchim, when we say that we have to progress, it's actually brought down that Malachim also have alias. Malachim also go from level to level. The difference is, and here's where your word's going to come to use again, Malachim, whenever they go to a higher level, it's all what's called Beseder Vahadraga. It's all sequential. We are Mahalchim, which means we have the ability to make quantum leaps. The difference between sequential and a quantum leap is, sequential is, you're not really leaving the place where you were, you're adding a little more and adding a little more. And when you're adding a little more and adding a little more, you don't have to negate and forget what you learned earlier to move on. But when you want to make a quantum leap, like Tama Bavli to Tama Yerushalmi, or you want to make a quantum leap like uh, from this world to Gan Eden, or from a seed to a tree, then you need to completely move away from where you were in order to be able to enter a completely different realm. And as we'll see soon, when that happens, there is a point of nefila in between. Oh, I see. There's a point of the fila when you're moving from one level to a completely different level because you have to realize I'm at the top of a certain level. I perfected that level. Now I'm moving to a new level. I'm just beginning. I'm just beginning that level. I'm not at the top of my game over there. In the previous level where I was, I did a lot of avoda. I was comfortable. I knew exactly where I was. Now I left that behind. I'm moving now to a higher level and now I'm struggling. So I'm in a place of nefila. I'm in a place. It's almost, for example, you know. I remember when my daughter, when she graduated from from uh, from junior high, and she went to high school. 
So I remember she came back from the, the, school, the school, the first day, second day, first week, and I asked her, how was it? She says, very hard. Why is that? She says, because last year I was in eighth grade. We were on the top of We were on the top of the school. And now we're the bottom class. We're ninth grade. We're the bottom. So you think about it. She went up to a completely new level, to high school. So the that's an aliyah. Yes, but there's also an afila there. There's also an afila over there. An afila. Because over here, suddenly you're, you're, you haven't mastered it. You're not there. So Sheva Yipil Tzadik Vikam means that Tzadik is constantly moving to a higher level and between every level there's an afila. There will be the Vikam. The Tzadik will eventually master also the higher Madriga. But there will be an afila in between. And by the way, just this alone, even before we go further, is you think about this for a second, that a Tzadik is always striving to reach higher levels. You'd think once you became a Tzadik, you're, you're in a good place, you're in a comfortable place. Gnug, enough, I'm finished. But a tzaddik is someone. Never finished. Sorry? Never finished. Never finished. Avoid <laughs> always. <laughs> He's looking for perfection. Shlemus. He's always. <laughs> no, that's not it's the, the term as we need to be. Yes. Why is it wrong? Why is it the wrong word? Why is it? Always trying to because chsidim are never looking for shlemus. Because shlemus is egotistical. <laughs> We're looking to serve Hashem even better than I did yesterday. There's a big difference between those two terminologies. That's shlemus. No. <laughs> even if it is, that's not what we're looking for. That's not the point. Shle- looking at the, 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 the quest for shlemus is a highly un uh, you No, know, you, You're going to go to Fabringen and you're going to tell people you're looking for shlemus. They're going to th- th- throw things at you. <laughs> you're going to get tomatoes thrown at you. <laughs> Who's looking for shlemus? It needs perfection. We're looking to serve Hashem. And my service of Hashem, the Rebbe spoke about this many, many times, especially on Hanukkah. That was a theme by the Rebbe. The first night of Hanukkah, you light the Menorah. And how many candles do you light? One. One. Not two. You're not supposed to light two. One. And you make the bracha, and you did the mitzvah 100%. Then, next day, comes along Torah and says, yesterday you did the mitzvah 100% perfect. There was nothing wrong with what you did yesterday. But because there's a rule of Mylan Bakoidash, for today one isn't enough. Today you need a light two. And if you don't light two, it's in the mitzvah. Okay, you're making the mitzvah, but you know, I'm not even saying Bidiyev, you're making the, the mitzvah, but it's it's not the way it's not Mahadra. Today that for today that's not enough. And then for tomorrow, but for today that's all. And for tomorrow, what? But actually it is, isn't the halacha that if you don't have candles, you... Yeah, I said you were kind of the mitzvah, but at the end of the day, al pimini Yisrael, which Torahi, on the second night, we lie too. We lie too. Um, it's a, and Rebbe spoke about this so many times, and it's like, this understanding, we think that I need to move higher because there's a problem with where I am right now. I'm in a flawed place. I make mistakes, I do a virus, I do something wrong, but if I was in a good place... Then what's wrong? If I reach Shlemus already, then all's good. If you're looking for Shlemus, then the Tzaddik could say, I reach Shlemus. But that's not but about it. But you can't reach absolute Shlemus. It's not about that. There's different levels I hear you. of Shlemus. But it's not, it's not about Shlemus. That's not my understanding. It's about serving. And another area that I would speak about it a lot is when it comes to, um, to, to um, Pesach. You know, we, I said Hanukkah, Pesach also, the Rebbe always spoke about that. This idea of Bechol, Yom, Yom, Every you have to leave Mitzrayim. And we know the pasuk says, "Ela masay bnei Yisrael asher yatsul me'aris Mitzrayim." So the question, the Chassidus asks, "What do you mean? These are the journeys of the Yidden that they went out of Mitzrayim. It was one journey out of Mitzrayim from Ramses to Sukkot." But the answer is no. We're always leaving Mitzrayim because I left Mitzrayim yesterday, and yesterday I was in a good place. Today. I'm back in Mitzrayim. Not that I'm back where I was yesterday. But if I stay where I am today, I'm in Mitzrayim. Today I have to break out of this. There is Mitzrayim. It's brought on many times, I've said this. There's Mitzrayim of Klippa. Then there's Mitzrayim of Kedusha. My good of yesterday is a Mitzrayim. is my limitation for today, which I need to break out of today. And a tzaddik also has to go out of Mitzrayim every day. So a tzaddik is also part of this process of being a Mahalach. And what's amazing is, what we said earlier, 
is that when we're not talking here about, about sequential um, leaps, the tzaddik is someone who realizes not only does he have to sequentially improve, but he has to make quantum leaps, even though that he's a tzaddik. He has, to, he has to realize that he has to completely, almost disavow everything and move to a completely new place. There's a famous story, which I know we spoke, we've spoken about this um, in the past. But even the, even the quantum leap, this would also become a metza, become Eventually, a, right. Then he has to yes, another quantum correct. And, and Yelchum Chayel Chayel, ultimately, the aliyah that we can make in Kedusha is bleak vol, because Hashem is bleak vol, and our Neshama is bleak vol. There's a story also which the Rebbe repeated many times about um, the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, Reb Shalom Dev Ber, that when he was a young boy of five or six years old, so he once went into his grandfather. It was on Shabbos Parshas Vayera, which was right around his birthday. His grandfather was the Tzemach Tzadak, Reb Menachem Mendel of Lubavitch, the third Lubavitcher Rebbe. And again, he, Reb Shalom Dev Ber was a young boy, five or six years old, and he started crying. And the grandfather asked him, why are you crying? So he said, in this week's parsha, we learned the Vayera Elov Hashem, that Hashem appeared to Avraham Avinu. Why is it that Hashem appeared to Avraham Avinu? Not and to me, he hasn't appeared. And the Samach Sadak answered, he said, that when a Yid, at the age of 99, decides and recognizes that he still has to do a bris milah, he's worthy that Hashem should reveal himself to him. Think about the depth of that. Here you have Avraham Avinu, who's 99 years old. How much has he accomplished in his 99 years? Tremendous. He's brought tens of thousands of, uh, of Gerim. Of Gerim. And he's the first person to recognize Hashem, and he was Mepharsim Hashem everywhere. But yet, at the age of 99, he realizes there's still an Avoida in front of him. Not, not a small Avoida. This huge Avoida. Of bris milah, which spiritually, what is the idea of bris milah means? The recognition that ultimately, at the end of the day, the heart is still fresh up. My avas Hashem has to be taken to an entirely new level. I need to make a bris. And at 99 years old, he's like, I'm going for it. I'm making this, this leap. And when you do that, you're worthy that Hashem should reveal Himself to you. When a tzaddik, when a tzaddik realizes, I need to be a mahalach, as great as my avoda is still today, I need to move to a completely different place. And that's really, uh, we're talking about tzaddikim, but tachva'amich kulam tzaddikim, we're all tzaddikim. And uh, this is something which we all have to realize, that we always have to be on the move, and always have to be upgrading, and not only because the situation before was bad necessarily, even in those areas which were good in our life, we still have to upgrade. Why? Because that's the idea of now. But it's scary to move up. Why is it scary to move up? Because sheva yipoil, because every, every move up, you ent you're entering a new area, a place where you're uncomfortable. A place we have a nefila, but we have to know that eventually it's going to be vikam. Eventually, that nefila will lead to a much greater place to have vikam. Yeah. I'm saying sheva ipol tzaddik vikam. Maybe it's a musa for us. We all benoni. But look at this tzaddikim dolim. They're still falling. We have to learn from them. He's a big tzaddik, and he fall. He, you know. So we can improving ourselves. You need, you need to improve your yodim of this pasuk. You do all the yodim. That's not, the Alter Rebbe is saying that's not what the Pasuk means. It doesn't, this Pasuk doesn't mean that a tzaddik, someone who's truly a tzaddik doesn't fall. It doesn't work that way. The nefila here is, you're moving to a higher level. level. It's a different, uh, and you have to do it. that's the way it is, between me and You want to say that, uh, and the Pasuk, the Pshut Yishol Mikra is different, but the, the Alter Rebbe says, you want to understand the Pnimis of this Pasuk, it, it doesn't mean a nefila, the way we, you know, we all oh, suddenly one day I wake up, today I had a nefila. So they can don't experience that kind of nefila. It's a different nefila altogether. Yes? What's the shadow? I don't know. I'm sure it's explained, but here the Rebbe doesn't go there. What? Maybe the I'm sure that there is significance to the shava. The fact it's that I don't know what it is doesn't mean that, uh, that it's not a significance. It's yeah. a physicality problem. Sorry? Like seven days, like eight is infinity, and seven is like... Seven know, represents a cycle, so cycle maybe... Of it's, the, yeah, of the... Uh, but I've not, I've not seen it spoken about, but I'm sure that it is spoken about. Okay. So let's do it again inside. We'll start, let's start again from uh, Achine. Five months from the top. Achine, you do all the but it's known to those who know, time of the crop. 
the meaning of the Pasuk might deceive that which it says, Kisheva Yipil Tzadik Vikam. Or Bifat especially, Sha'adam Nikra Mahalach Vilay Emet. A person, we know, is a Mahalach, always moving up. Doesn't stand uh, in the same place. We always have to move from one level to another. We're not supposed to stay in one madrega, even if it's very nice and very good. But ultimately, that's Mitzrayim. And between one level to another level, before you reach the higher level, you're in a level of Nefila from the first madrega. The Rebbe gives an example for this in a letter. He says, imagine that you have, a, you have a Magid that comes to town and gives a speech, a very emotional speech, to the point that uh, there are tears flowing from the eyes of everyone in the audience. And then the next speaker stands up. The next speaker is a much greater speaker than the first one. And his, when, by the time he finishes his speech, not only is tears going falling down everyone's uh, cheeks, but everyone is actually sobbing aloud. Because he lifted them to even higher level of, let's say, of tshuva. But let me ask you. When the first Magid was speaking, everyone, their tears were coming down their eyes. What happened when the second Magid stood up and for the first three minutes of his, spe of his speaking? No one's crying. Why? Because they needed to move away from the first speech to be able to Focus. put themselves into the frame of mind of the second speech, but it takes time. So there's an afila here. They're not actually at the level of emotional awakening they were during the first one, even though this guy is a much greater speaker and eventually will take them to much greater heights. Because if you want to appreciate the higher one, you actually need to move away from your thoughts and your preoccupation with what the first person was saying. But for that moment, you're in a state of nefila. So you can say nefila is like detachment from something? Like, uh, like, uh, sort of like, uh, not attached. It's a state of instability. You're not, you haven't found, got your bearings yet in the new Madrega where you are. So now the question becomes, what, wh how, what supports the tzaddik during his state of nefila? What keeps the tzaddik um, still on firm footing? And that's what we're going to find out when Mr. Shem in the next class. That's going to be the original level of Ava. The lower level of Ava is going to end up being what keeps the tzaddik stable during those periods of nefila. We'll do that next class, which might not necessarily, which will, will, will not be next week. Next week, Mir Tashem, there will be a special Fabrengen over here. We'll have Rabbi Label Groner, Tuesday? the Rabbi Secretary, Thursday night, 9 o'clock. Wow. It'll be a Fabrengen in honor of Chayel, the 18th of El, and also in honor of the Siyum of Lakuti and Maram. We never properly celebrated the Siyum, and also in honor of the beginning of Shariyich of Amunah. It should be a special Fabrengen. Um, come and tell your friends about it and even people who aren't your friends you can tell them also and bring everyone along for a, a very special fabric well, have a good Shabbos everyone